Welcome to the third episode of the Strauss Center Space Policy Informational Video Series. My name is Alyssa Gessler. I'm a Brumley Fellow at the Strauss Center, and today I'm going to talk to you about space war. Technically, I'm actually talking about the militarization and weaponization of outer space, but that just doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well. Outer space activities can be divided into three sectors, civil, commercial, and security. Civil space activities encompass all activities that are funded by civilian governments and often undertaken for scientific purposes. NASA is a good example of a civil space organization. Commercial space activities are those activities which are funded and implemented by private companies. And finally, the security space sector encompasses all activities that are funded and implemented by military or intelligence agencies. The terms weaponization and militarization of space are often used interchangeably, but they have important distinctions. Weaponization of space is generally understood to refer to the placement on orbit of space-based devices that have a destructive capacity. A prominent variety of this technology are anti-satellite weapons, or ASATs. There are kinetic ASATs, like ballistic missiles or grappling arms or hooks that can physically drag a spacecraft out of orbit. There are also non-kinetic ASATs, like lasers, which can disable a satellite entirely, frequency jamming attacks, which can interfere with the operator's ability to communicate with a satellite, or cyber attacks. Many of the technologies used for hostile operations in space can also serve peaceful purposes. This is the whole problem with rendezvous and proximity operations, or RPOs. The Aerospace Corporation defines RPOs as two or more satellites matching their plane, altitude, and phasing. That's the rendezvous aspect. Then, whilst roughly on the same orbit, performing maneuvers to affect their relative state or position. That's the proximity piece. The issue is that without communication between spacefaring actors, it's nearly impossible to ascertain if a spacecraft carrying this type of technology has peaceful purposes or hostile purposes. The term militarization of space, in contrast, refers to the broader trend of space increasingly becoming a military domain. Now, space has been an important tool of warfighting since the first anthropogenic object was put in orbit, but in recent years, it has become an actual field of warfighting. This is because nations are now able to disrupt vital military operations, like military GPS or nuclear warning systems. Satellites play a key role in ballistic missile early warning systems, so the capacity of a nation to disrupt this service is particularly concerning. Intelligence operations can also be interrupted in space, as nations use reconnaissance satellites, or spy satellites, to observe other countries and provide national security decision makers with strategic information. And there are a slew of space operations that are not technically housed in the national security sector, but would nonetheless have very negative effects on national security were they to be interrupted. In short, Outer space activities, while generating a host of benefits to humanity, has also produced a slew of new vulnerabilities across all space sectors, civil, commercial, and security. What rules and regulations govern all of this military activity in space? I'm so glad you asked. The 1967 Outer Space Treaty stipulates in its first article that outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be free for the exploration and use of states without discrimination of any kind. This freedom of space doctrine has been functioning as a norm since the launch of the first anthropogenic object into orbit, the Soviet Sputnik satellite in 1957, and has enabled countries to observe one another, identifying different threats and ensuring compliance with different international treaties, among other things. The Outer Space Treaty also stipulates that states shall undertake not to place in orbit around Earth any objects carrying nuclear weapons or any other kind of weapons of mass destruction, to install such weapons on celestial bodies, or station such weapons in outer space in any other manner. This obviously doesn't give explicit reference to anti-satellite technologies, but some have argued that it effectively bans the use of such technologies. Article 7 of the Outer Space Treaty also uh, 
establishes liability for damage damage caused in outer space, which was elaborated on by the 1971 UN Convention on International Liability for Damage Caused by Space Objects. Taken together, Article 7 and this convention make it clear that the use of anti-satellite technology against another nation's assets in space is prohibited. This does not necessarily mean that a state can't use ASAT technology to destroy one of its own satellites. In 2007, China incited global uproar when it deliberately destroyed one of its own aging weather satellites using a ground-based medium-range ballistic missile. In addition to illustrating China's ability to conduct an attack of this nature on any nation's space object, this event is particularly notable because it generated thousands of pieces of orbital debris, contributing to the haphazard congestion of lower Earth orbit. But China is not the only nation that's been playing this game. The US, Russia, and India have all conducted similar ASAT tests, a concerning trend that some have come to label a space arms race. An arms race occurs when two or more nations develop and accumulate technology in order to try and gain a military or political advantage. Arms races can escalate quickly in response to a real or perceived threat. Therefore, it is necessary to innovate means of boosting transparency among space actors in order to decrease the likelihood of entering into a conflict over a perceived, but perhaps non-existent, threat. In assessing the potential threat posed by another spacefaring nation, countries often utilize what is referred to as a threat equation, wherein threat has three components. First, the capability to cause harm, or the physical capacity to harm another object in space. Second, the opportunity, or the requisite spatial temporal conditions to cause harm. And third, intent, or the will or desire to cause harm. Intent is important here. Say, for instance, another spacefaring nation's object moves off course unexpectedly. If we didn't have advance notice of that maneuver, we may assume malicious intent and escalate the situation by taking military action. If, however, we, there was transparency between us and that other spacefaring nation, and we had advance notice, then we may have had insight into at least their stated intent. This is why it is so crucial to innovate new policy means of boosting transparency between spacefaring nations whenever possible. There are a few ways in which this clarification of intent and simultaneous boosting of transparency in space can be achieved. There are four countries that we know of that are currently leading the charge of the militarization of space, the United States, Russia, China, and India. These countries could enter into bilateral agreements that would enshrine limited data sharing and advance notice of maneuvers in space in order to boost communication and thereby decrease the likelihood of misperceptions over seemingly hostile behavior. This is only a jumping off point though. Little attention has been paid to the role of new space actors in enhancing space security. In the long run, efforts will need to be made to achieve an inclusive deliberation process on the issue of space security to ensure that all spacefaring nations have buy-in. Some have also suggested that the commercialization of space may enhance space security, given that private companies that are investing heavily in their space assets have an incentive to lobby their government to enact policies that protect their assets by avoiding a conflict in space. Time will tell if this policy innovation will come to fruition. In the near term, the dominant space powers need to take on a leadership role in de-escalating space by enacting agreements that enhance transparency and accountability. Another important means of clarifying intent and therefore decreasing the likelihood of erroneous threat perception in space is quantifying and assessing how states are interpreting existing legal frameworks for space. A team here at UT Austin has undertaken to compare how states are interpreting Article 11 of the Outer Space Treaty by tracking and comparing the amount of time it takes them to report a new launch to the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs. According to Article 11 of the Outer Space Treaty, states must report new launches to that office to the greatest extent feasible and practicable. The lag time between the launch date of a certain object and the date of reporting to the UN USA office 
ranges from a month to upwards of three years, illustrating that states have interpreted the term practicable quite differently. In the context of the militarization of space, similar efforts should be undertaken to ascertain how states are interpreting existing legal frameworks, such as the UN Convention on Liabilities reference to harmful interference. We simply cannot sustain worthwhile dialogues on these pressing issues without first knowing the state of play from a quantitative perspective. Such transdisciplinary research is an integral component of resisting the trend of the militarization of space.